Live from our seven Tasmania studios, your nightly news with Kim Miller begins now. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Well, first tonight, police have revealed the identity of the woman whose body was found in Launceston on Boxing Day. 49-year-old Jin Gai Zhang was allegedly murdered inside a Wellington Street residence. Police have also confirmed the name of the man facing murder charges. Our reporter, Elizabeth O'Neill, has more details. Authorities have confirmed Tobias Pick, a 27-year-old German national, has been charged with one count of murder and one count of stealing. It follows the grim discovery of a 49-year-old woman's body in a bedroom at a Wellington Street residence on the evening of Boxing Day. She's been identified as Xingai Zhang, an Australian permanent resident of Chinese origin. Mr Pick faced an out-of-hours court of petty sessions last night and has been remanded in custody. He's expected to face court again tomorrow morning. Mr Pick has been living in Australia for at least several months on a working holiday visa. While police haven't revealed how Ms Zhang died, a post-mortem has confirmed she was murdered. Authorities are still investigating the death and are urging anyone with information to come forward. Well, Salmon Penn has caught a light at Hewan Aquaculture's Hideaway Bay Farm. Onlookers captured the moment smoke billowed from the water near Dover. The salmon giant says the pen was empty at the time and the fire caused minor damage to the outer railing. It's the third incident to hit the company since November, including when almost 200,000 salmon escaped from pens. Tasmania's travel bubble with New Zealand has been delayed until March. Direct flights had been expected to start next month, following a Commonwealth deal. Now the state government says upgrades at Hobart Airport will be completed by the first quarter of next year. It says negotiations with a preferred airline are also nearing finalisation. Well, more race meetings have been cancelled at Elwick, thrusting the embattled racing industry into further trouble. Our reporter, Josh Duggan, has the details. Now, Josh, what reason has Taz, Taz Racing provided for cancelling tomorrow's meet? Kim, Taz Racing says the track needs more restoration work before racing can resume. It says even if it could have been ready in time, it would have been detrimental to the track. They've also transferred a January 8 meeting to Launceston. That means the course has until the 24th to be in raceworthy condition. It follows the late cancellation of a meet on Sunday, with some in the industry calling the track woes dumbfounding and unexplainable. The track only recently underwent a $12.5 million redevelopment, making this news all the more disappointing, Kim. Mm, it certainly is. Thank you very much, Josh Duggan. A driver and a dog have made a lucky escape after their truck rolled over on the Midland Highway this afternoon. Witnesses say the truck hit the inside kerb of the roundabout on Main Road at Perth and rolled off the road. The truck driver and dog were uninjured. As we go to air tonight, emergency services are still clearing the scene. Well, one of Tassie's iconic tourist spots is serving its famous pancakes for the last time this week. Mount Elephant Pancakes will close on Thursday, with the current operators moving on. Having been employed here at the time, Louise Williams and her family jumped at the chance to take over Elephant Pass Pancakes ten years ago. It was a good decision, yeah. yeah it's been fun. Like We've met lots of different people, which has been really, really nice. But her two-decade association with the business ends this week. The family will fire up the stoves for the last time this Thursday. I think I'll be a bit teary, to be honest. I hadn't really thought about it, but the gentleman who actually built the place back in 79, he's coming back on Thursday as well. And it's unlikely to reopen again, with little interest in taking it over. Hopefully someone will come along. You need a family to come in and do it, because it's just too hard to do it on your own. The parlour is one of Tassie's most iconic tourist attractions and it'll be missed by anyone who's been lucky enough to grab a bite of one of these famous pancakes. Pretty good. We're in Tassie every school holidays and we would come up here, well this time we've come up a lot because we knew the guys were closing, so we've come up like every second day, but we normally come up once or twice a week while we're here. It's been 10 years of hard work and now the Williams family are looking forward to a well-earned break before some new adventures. I've given myself seven days to pack up here and start a new job, so that'll be nice. But in the new job, I'm not starting at quarter to five like I did this morning. Josh Duggan, 7 Tasmania News. 
Well, in a year dominated by the pandemic, it's easy to forget the other events that shaped 2020. From tales of tragedy to resilience and heartwarming community spirit, we take a look back at the other stories that made headlines. January 1st, 2020. Flames tearing through the Derwent Valley in Fingal. Crews battling to save homes, lives and vegetation. Just watching it come closer and closer was terrifying. Really scary. I'm so stressed. Stressed and nervous. <laughs> then, just weeks into the year, tragedy struck. We just haven't been able to find those signs of life that we were wishing for. Rescue crews at the Henty Gold Mine worked around the clock, searching for Cameron Goss. His death mourned by an entire community. For a lot of people, they've been operating down there, they've been in the same areas, then they know it well. At Stanley, another family left in shock. A 10-year-old boy snatched from his fishing boat by a shark, lucky to be alive. It was a shock to all those involved, a shock to our family. You're probably not likely to see it again, but it happened and we have to move forward. Turning to politics and Will Hodgman made this announcement. I'll be resigning as a member of our state's parliament, uh, the leader of the Liberal Party and as Premier of Tasmania. Treasurer Peter Gubwin would take his place. Little did he know just how the year would unfold. My parliamentary Liberal Party colleagues have elected me to be the leader of the Liberal Party and the 46th Premier of Tasmania. Amongst political upheaval, the government left facing a shocking and disturbing wave of child sex abuse allegations, launching a state-based royal commission, the first in Tasmania for 20 years. It sends the message to survivors that um, the concerns of what have happened in the past and what, what is still happening um, are being taken seriously. And inside the walls of parliament, there was another monumental change on the way. It's one of those pieces of legislation that will be remembered and will be appreciated by those who have to use it. Proposed voluntary assisted dying legislation, now the closest it's ever been to becoming law. It's been bittersweet. We've lost our mum, um, but she's healed a part of our hearts and being here through Parliament with us. A victory of a different kind coming in November. War veteran Teddy Sheehan given justice at last. His Victoria Cross finally in the hands of his nephew. It's a real eerie feeling, I can't explain it, but it's just that I feel that he's up there and, and he's acknowledged that we've got it. At the same time, Tasmania was making international headlines of a different kind. Australia's largest ever whale stranding unfolding at Strawn. Emotions and resilience running high as an army of rescuers worked to save lives. We've got live animals that, that have a chance uh, and we have the crew and the resources to, to shift them, uh, then we'll certainly give it a go. See that movement and know there's, they have a chance uh, is an amazing feeling. Uh, to, to have that in amongst so much tragedy and sadness. Turning to the sporting stage and the eyes of the nation were on Tasmania, the first BBL hub, eight games across ten days. I'm really happy to bring on the cricket, the most BBL games that's ever been played in Tasmania in any one season. And in basketball, the jack jumpers emerge from their nest. Something fresh, new and energetic. Stuart McSwain continued smashing records. A few yards to go, McSwain is going to take the win and he's done it. And Alex Peroni announced he's taking his career to America. We just looked at it and it just looked like the best decision for us in, in every way basically and very excited for a new challenge. 2020, a year that tore us apart, but also brought us together. Rallying as one, Tasmanians looked out for one another. From his front yard, Oliver's car wash raised money as fires decimated the mainland. It makes me happy because um, so all the animals can get saved. These legends of their local footy tipping met their hero. Who's your favourite player? Uh, Dan Butler. Dan Butler. The player himself stopping for a chat. How are you guys going down in Tassie? Local history was restored. The Linda Hotel never forgotten. We cried before we left and we cried after, weeks after. And uh, we didn't want to leave Linda. How good is this? And in yet another 2020 curveball, Launceston became a winter wonderland. Snow blanketing the city. Wake up, it's, there's snow all over in our backyard. It's a miracle. I was like, whoa, snow. A year of unprecedented change, but remarkable communities. Michelle Wisby, 7 Tasmania News.
In the second of our series, looking back at an unprecedented year in politics, we sit down with Labor leader Rebecca White. She reflects on what's been a difficult year for the opposition party and her confidence Labor can bounce back in the polls before the next election. When the pandemic hit and Tasmania went into lockdown, the state's opposition leader Rebecca White found herself putting politics to the side in a COVID ceasefire, working alongside the Premier to tackle the crisis. I'm relieved the government um, took those decisions early and they did make hard decisions with our full support. Labor pushing the government to act quickly. I'd have to say those early days were very tense. And it didn't take long for the relationship to sour. I made the point the other day that I'd stop speaking to you because I couldn't trust you. The Labor Party no longer offered briefings, accused of playing politics. We were in a state of emergency. There was a public health emergency. They'd been granted enormous power by the parliament really to make decisions without um, any one holding them to account. There were conversations that we were having privately, but also that we were having in public forums. And of course, our job isn't just to speak behind closed doors. We have a job to represent the community. While the government's handling of the pandemic saw Peter Gutwin's popularity skyrocket at the opposition's expense. Has it been difficult being an opposition leader during a pandemic? Uh, there's no doubt looking across the country that opposition parties have really struggled to get their narrative out or to be heard or to set the agenda because coronavirus still dominates and rightfully so we're still seeing outbreaks across the country. Despite the polls, Rebecca White is confident she'll lead her party to the next election. After a crushing loss in 2018, she says she has unfinished business. Do you think Labor could win an election? Labor can always win an election. You start at zero as soon as that election's called. With good candidates, strong campaigns, a really clear vision for our state, I believe the Labor Party can win the next election. Her confidence boosted by the election of Bastian Seidel to the Legislative Council this year. At a time when many people were dealing with the pandemic and um, probably not turning their mind to politics, we were fortunate to elect someone like Bastian to the parliament. It's unclear whether we'll see an early election called next year, but either way, Rebecca White says Labor is prepared. We'll be hitting the ground uh, very early on in 2021, making sure we're out there in the community, talking with them about Labor's jobs plan, about our plan to make Tasmania in a better and fairer place. Next side, 7 Tasmania News. With major events off the calendar, Tasmania's holiday hotspots are seeing waves of tourists. Locals are heading back to the shack while the welcome mat has been rolled out for interstate guests. From pandemic to paradise, this is truly a tazzy way to end a year we'd all rather forget. Look, the bonus is it's just not far from home, so, you know, it doesn't take ages to get here in the car. Hello, look at the view. <laughs> it's beautiful, it's very relaxing, picturesque. The beach at Orford is like swimming in a postcard. Sparkling water, perfect for a paddle or a dip even if you don't mean to. We're just at the beach and I'm about to go on the kayak. At Triabana, the lunch rush is on. Colleen Parker's coffee van has been flat out with the flat whites, giving Mariah Island explorers one final caffeine hit. Heaps of people around again. The boat's back to doing five trips a day, seven days a week. And it's at full capacity. Most trips now to 140 passengers each trip. So for the last couple of days, it's just been flat out. And today's no exception, with visitors from Victoria. I've been planning it, it's kind of got me through lockdown, the idea of coming down and doing a bit of hiking and camping, so yeah. And cold Queenslanders. We're from Cairns, so we've got our jackets. Yeah. <laughs> Five star reviews from those off the ferry. Beautiful, yeah, stunning there. While the East Coast might look busy enough, some businesses say they're still feeling the sting of Australia's closed borders and Sydney's northern beaches outbreak. There are still spots free at Gina Diprose's caravan park, something almost unheard of in summer. Twelve months ago we were um, completely full in January and February. And yeah, what are your bookings know. looking like at the moment? They're scattered. They're scattered. Um, they're getting there though. They're, um, they're picking up. High hopes with the new year just around the corner. Sean McComish, 7 Tasmania News. Two talented glassmakers in Tasmania have had their wares catch the eye of the world's rich and famous. Peter Bowles and Anne Clifton's pieces have been sought after by the likes of Billy Connolly and Elton John. Now the couple has a new gallery to showcase their work. 
In an unassuming building in Invermay, a local couple is creating spectacular glass pieces, attracting a growing list of celebrity clientele. Paul Keating, Billy Connolly and, um, and my favourite story is the Baz Luhrmann story. So Baz Luhrmann was looking for a present for Elton John's wedding and, um, and he saw one of Peter's enormous perfume bottles and it was luscious, it was big and it sort of had um, aqua and white design and then a big spire stopper and it was ostentatious and it was the biggest piece we had made at that stage and Baz just looked at that one and just went Elton John. On. The pieces from Glass Manifesto are being showcased in exhibitions across the globe, including Europe, North America, the Middle East and Asia. The works travel, they speak all different languages, they are recognised as being beautiful, well-made, beautiful quality, unusual. And they're not easy to make. Layers of coloured and translucent glass are put on top of one another and the glass is blown to create the desired shape. Each glass piece here is unique in colour and design and can take up to three months to make. This pattern here took four years to develop. We never get a true representation of the colour until the piece has cooled down, which can be two or three days in the cooling down. So as we're making work, we're never fully understanding the piece until it's actually cold. Elizabeth O'Neill, 7 Tasmania News. While Alive took out line honours in the Launceston to Hobart last night, Detail First is the provisional overall winner. It was a tough race for the underdogs who say the result is unbelievable. The last leg of the Launceston to Hobart. Detail First sailing down the Derwent, vying for first place in the handicap stakes. Beating the crew of Heatway, next in line for the title, waiting nervously on shore. Just sitting here, just absolutely fretting, waiting to see whether we can pull this off. But it wasn't their day. Detail first crossing the finish line, the provisional overall winner of the race. How are you feeling? Feeling absolutely fantastic. Great to be home. We got a little bit worried there at the end when the breeze dropped out, but um, we just had a really brilliant race. Welcomed back to shore and congratulated with open arms. Oh, no, I'm so proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> I told you not to come back in the shore. Skipper Scott Broadby says the result is unbelievable. We've worked really hard for this. Um, this is my fourth one that we've done. Um, and last year we, uh, we finished top three, which was a great result, but we said to ourselves we're really going to push it this year, and uh, we certainly did that. We'll be having um, celebrations for a few days now. <laughs> While Alive finished at 7.30 last night, claiming line honours and beating the race record. The boat a late entry to the race after the cancellation of the Sydney to Hobart. Yeah, just disappointed that we couldn't, uh, that we couldn't compete in the Sydney to Hobart. It was a lot of prep work for, for that race. Um, so, but yeah, to be able to come down here and, and do this race instead um, and get the record is uh, very, very pleasing. And on a much smaller boat, Jean-Pierre and Richard made up the two-person crew of Hypnautic, the smallest in the fleet. And uh, yeah, you wonder why you do it, but at the end, you're very happy to have done it. It'd be nice to have a cappuccino and a croissant. <laughs> the final results won't be known until all of the boats finish the race, but that's not likely to stand in the way of celebrations. Yeah! Meg Sides, 7 Tasmania News. Good evening, everyone. Hope at the state's top again today, reaching 23 degrees. Launceston and Burnie both 20 and 19 in Devonport. St Helens and Friendly Beach has also saw the top of 23 today, 21 in Grove. The islands both 19 and 16 degrees in both Strawn and Low Head. Mid to low level cloud can be seen over much of Tasmania today, with wisps of higher cloud crossing the state through the afternoon. Across Australia, mid to high level cloud with embedded thunderstorms covers much of the northeastern half of the country, while patches of mid level cloud sit over the west of Western Australia. Tomorrow's chart shows a trough about eastern Tasmania moving away during the morning as a cold front crosses the southern part of the state through the day. A high pressure system follows the cold front and pushes a ridge into South Australia. West to northwesterly winds tomorrow, 10 to 20 knots about the south and northeast in the morning, otherwise variable 5 to 10 knots with afternoon sea breezes. Showers developing and 21 in Hobart and Jeeveston tomorrow, 22 in Bothwell. Launceston, 25 with early fog, partly cloudy and 21 in Devonport, 25 in Cressy. 
21 degrees in Burnie tomorrow, morning showers and 20 in Strawn, Curry a top of 19. And 21 in St Helens, Swansea 20 with developing showers and 21 in Orford. And the UV tomorrow is extreme 12s right across the state. Looking on to Thursday now, showers about eastern, central and southern areas contracting to the north during the afternoon. Fine apart from possible showers about the north and northeast on New Year's Day. And on Saturday, showers about the north extending statewide in the afternoon. 39 in Perth tomorrow, Adelaide 28, partly cloudy and 23 in Melbourne, a shower or two in Sydney and Brisbane and 36 degrees in Alice Springs. And it's currently partly cloudy across the state with Hobart 21, 19 degrees in Launceston and Devonport 18. And Kim, that's Tuesday's weather. Thank you very much, Chelsea. And we are out of time, so thanks for joining us tonight. Good night.